Let's go back all the way to 2001, you know, 9-11, you guys are starting a family. Give us a sense of what were you up against trying to start a company that leaned into this concept of renewable or alternative or new. We didn't have the term transition. Energy yeah. transition didn't exist. Decarbonization didn't exist. I mean, North Carolina was fortunate enough to have the solar center attached to NC State where I went mm -hmm. to school. So I spent time there and took classes around solar energy in the day. and. Solar thermal is what it was. There was yeah. very little solar PV that was on satellites and that was about it. I had been fortunate enough to work in the solar industry when I was in college. And so we worked on solar thermal systems and we repaired systems from Jimmy Carter's days, right? There were probably a dozen people in North Carolina in the solar industry then. And in reality, you know, it took years and years before it turned into like a financially sustainable business, but we built it, you know, block by block from yeah. the bottom up. Hey, welcome back, Solar Warriors. I am so excited to bring today's episode to life. And I'll tell you, if you've been checking out our YouTube, you know that we've been doing a number of in-person interviews. In fact, I've just come back from San Francisco where I captured two amazing live interviews and a third that I can't quite yet talk about. But today's episode, we could talk a lot about, and it's two of my favorite local, that's North Carolina for me, local solar entrepreneurs, Bob and Maria Kingry. Now, many of you who've been listeners for a long time have asked, Nico, why haven't you had Bob and Maria on? They're practically local legends, certainly here in North Carolina, having been around for more than 22 years. This B Corporation that is one of the original the OGs that helped kick off the North Carolina solar market, helping elevate it to number, I think, two of the top 10 states doing solar in the United States over the last decade. They've just had such a tremendous impact on local legislature, local uh, resources and, uh, and community. They've employed hundreds, hundreds of people. They've had such a tumultuous as well as tremendous and successful 20 plus year career building this business. And they have been at the helm of it the entire time. Today, we're going to hear all about a business that has that has employed hundreds, has built over 3,000 local solar arrays, nearly 1,000 Tesla Powerwalls to boot. The ups and downs, how uh, they went through the process of really investing in the culture that is Southern Energy Management, what sets it apart as a business, what you can learn from the decisions they've made around being a benefit corporation, B Corp, or whether or not to sell the company and how to run it in lieu of selling it. They've been through practically every up and down you could imagine. But without further ado, it is time to dig into today's practical, tactical insights, today's deep dive conversation with two incredible entrepreneurs right here from my home state of North Carolina, Bob and Maria Kingery here on Suncast. I read that somewhere you said, and I'm sure it's not the only time you've said, that you are an impact junkie. <laughs> yeah. Tell me what that means for you. I'm not sure that I really like the word junkie, honestly. I'm not <laughs> sure how PC that is. Mm -hmm. um, but Bob used to say, what did you used to say? You used to say we were, was it impact junkies? Were you the one who first I don't think that? so. You said we were something, ju growth junkies. Like when we were growing. We, we lost that habit after <laughs> we, did, we, did, we did. That didn't turn out so well. But yeah, so my stated purpose in life, Nico, is to impact the impactors. Uh, and so for me, what that means is like, I, and I really do get high on helping other people to increase their impact. That yeah. is what brings me joy in the world and what gets me excited. So, Where'd you guys first meet? At a party. The in, Ra in Raleigh. In Raleigh. We're back in, uh, I was in school at NC State. Yeah. And uh, friends with a close friend of Maria's. And Maria came down for a party, freshman mm -hmm. year in college. And we met there. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Freshman year. Sure enough. And I said, and I still say this when I tell the story, mm. like he hopped out in this Ford Econoline van in these short shorts. <laughs> umbros. You wore socks. These umbros and this sort of cut off t-shirt and not the kind of guy I would normally go for, no. but I was like, he shined. Yeah. He really did. He just was like, <gasps> mm. yeah. So here we are. 
When you describe now the problem that Southern Energy Management is designed to solve, how do you describe that without speaking about the company? The structure that we're set up in the Carolinas is really not set up for long-term sustainable thinking, mm -hmm. both how you build houses and how power is generated. And so I feel like the the problem we're trying to resolve is the fact that our laws and our rules are not set up for the long-term sustainable thinking. And uh, lots of people believe in that, so we don't have any trouble finding people that are interested in what we believe in. Yeah. Um, but like the structure around us is not set up for that. With that as the framework, Maria, would you introduce us, those who are unfamiliar with Southern Energy Management? Sure. And why it's set up to address that problem that Bob just enunciated? Certainly. So Southern Energy Management, we started this company in 2001. Uh, shortly after 9-11, we wanted to have an impact in the world. We were pregnant with our first and what we now know to be our only child. Mm -hmm. And so we birthed this company and uh, our son at the same time. Twins. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> he would say so. Different personalities. Yeah, sure. they, they, they were both at every dinner table for many years, that's, that's for right. sure. Um, but we, our stated purpose is to improve the way people make and, with capital A and D, use energy. Right. So we work both with builders and developers and planners to help develop more sustainable uh, energy, like on the front end, the yeah. energy efficiency side. And then we also work with those folks to help them produce their own energy uh, to move toward, you know, our dream is net zero. Right. And, and and even net positive. Right. We have some homes that we have worked on that mm, are net giving positive back. energy. Yeah. Bob, 22 years in the making, you are not immune to the growth junkie aspect yeah. uh, that was um, beholden of many of us in the in the solar industry over the last 20 years. Probably at some point thought that you would have already sold the company and figured out how to retire. And yet, and and yet here One you would think. Well, and yet play. here you are. You've built a durable business that feeds hundreds of families. Yeah. Um, could you describe the feeling for you now, twenty two years later, walking in the door on a Monday morning, getting ready for work? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I still love to come to work on Monday mornings. That still is twists me in the right way. Um, you know, the feeling on Monday mornings now is um, how are we going to continue to refine our team and give the skill sets that we need to continue to grow the company and have more impact. That's the that's what the Monday mornings are about for me. And so my job primarily is to lead the leaders here. Um, through a variety of sort of all they have, we have different business channels that are income producing and we have leaders in each of those. So my job is to help those leaders to refine their businesses and to be more successful at a, at a core level though, internally though, like, uh, it is interesting that we haven't retired and sold our business. Um, we've we held on to it as a family-owned business and have never really taken any money from outside sources at all. Amazing. Um, yeah, and that's been good and bad. I'm sure there's been times where that was good, times where that was bad. Yeah. But in the end, like you know, there's a 175 or so families here, and uh, mm. the goal is to try to find ways that we're going to be successful together. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to pull a thread on that. Yeah. I have a bunch of different questions, but I'm going to try to d drill down as as the opportunity presents itself. Our mutual friend Jeff Greenfield, when I interviewed him, said that his one regret was that he didn't raise money for the business soon enough or early enough. And in so doing, he mentioned, you know, just far too many uh, painful Christmases that had he done it differently, raised money, he probably would have endured in a different way. Um, he would have raised money earlier, uh, would have sought partnership faster, um, you know, hindsight being what it is. and. Jeff has now had an opportunity to sell, uh, at least uh, he has had a chance to sort of liquidate some of his ownership in that business. Why, after 22 years, have you decided not to take outside investment? And I, I have to imagine that it has not been, that it has been one that you have had some sleepless nights over. And uh, there are implications for being able to bootstrap it. And then there are sacrifices as well. It's obviously a conversation that we have had many times. And, and we've also wondered ourselves, like, are we just naive and foolish? And like, could we have a greater impact? Mm. 
I will say for myself, and, and I won't speak for Bob, but I'll say for myself, I have seen a lot of entrepreneurs who have raised money and it's not necessary. And I've asked myself this question a lot. Is it about control? Like we just we just <laughs> yeah. don't want to, like we're unemployable. We don't want to answer anybody. Yeah. That's certainly, I think, a part of, of it. it. Yeah, that's a totally. part of it, yeah. right? Um, yep. our B Corp values, for example, and we make decisions that often are not in the short term interest of right. financial uh, return. So that's a part of it. Yeah. But more than that, I've I've seen and it could just be the bias of the lens that I'm looking through. But I've seen a lot of times where it hasn't worked out for entrepreneurs, yeah. where their business got taken in a direction that was not what they or their team really intended. And so for us, uh, again, we have people who have been here 18 years, yeah. 17 years. And I think the average tenure is like, I don't know how many we have, we have in double digits or like t more than 20 people have been here longer than 10 years. Yeah. And so every decision that we make, we make with those people right. and, and, and the newer folks as well. But but those people I'm on, our team, and for us, uh, we've thrown around the term benevolent dictator mm -hmm. quite, a, <laughs> quite a while, quite a bit recently. We're so comfortable with the level of risk that we take every day. Not every day mm -hmm. are we comfortable with it, right? And Bob bears most of the brunt of that mm -hmm. burden yeah. of the cash flow, you know, and, and that kind of thing. And are we going to make payroll, which... Where some wood. We fortunately have yeah. not had that issue for a while. Mm -hmm. But um, it's about, you know, our our vision is to follow in the footsteps of some of the companies that we admire most and find mm -hmm. a way for our team to really benefit from the wealth that this company produces. And so. Yeah, I think we're stubborn. In some ways, and I think part of the lens of like we do want to we want to do it the way that we want to do it because it's been successful. Yeah, and so like we get pursued every week by someone who wants to buy our business, <laughs> um, and uh, and our business is unique. Doing energy efficiency and solar is very different, and uh, and it's proven to be valuable as the solar coaster goes up and down. Um, but I think a part of it, a chunk of it is like our own just being able to make our decisions. I think a part of it is that we enjoy running the business. Mm. Like we enjoy our roles. And when that changes, like I'm sure that it'll be a challenge. And we've had Christmases that were challenging um, a couple of times in our careers here. We've had really challenging Christmases in reality. Um, but overall, like we've got ourselves in a good sustainable footing and uh, and we like what we do. And yeah. so like, what would you do? When you look around, it's kind of like, what would we do differently? And it's like, I like what I do. So that's a big chunk of it as well, I think. And if I can speak one other, just one other thing for us. So again, going back to our purpose of mm -hmm. improving the way people make and use energy, this marriage of these two things for, for many, for, you know, two decades it's yeah. felt like they were two very separate things mm -hmm. and we can see the convergence of those and so with battery storage and the things that are uh coming online now mm -hmm. that are making really uh owning your own energy more uh feasible and affordable and sustainable we just believe that these two things are going to converge and we haven't part of it is like we're I don't know. We haven't seen what it's all going to be yet. Yeah, and we don't want to yeah. miss that opportunity to to mm. to have an influence and make an impact. And still a little space. bit of impact and growth junkie in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 totally. yeah, yeah. Uh, and stubbornness. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you you started the business in two thousand one. Could you paint a picture for those who like? Yeah, you know, I started my first company in two thousand six. I first met uh, Blair as a as an employee oh, of wow. Southern Energy Management mm -hmm. at the SEPA conference in 2011 in Arizona, um, or maybe New Mexico. I feel like maybe it was New Mexico, but um, there's a whole other story we'll get into that was like yeah. happening around that time that yeah. I want to know about as well. But yeah. um, let's go back all the way to 2001, uh, you know, 9-11, you guys are starting a family. Give us uh, a sense of what solutions existed at that time. What were you up against trying to start a company that leaned into this concept of sort of renewable or alternative or new or 
we didn't have the term transition. Energy yeah. transition didn't exist. Decarbonization didn't exist. I mean, North Carolina was fortunate enough to have the solar center attached to NC State where I went mm -hmm. to school. So I spent time there and took classes around solar energy in the day and mm. solar thermal is what it was. There yeah. was very little solar PV. It was, you know, it was on satellites and that was about it yeah. um, in the 22 years ago. Um, and so we left a opportunity at Burt's Bees where we were able to put a little bit of money in the bank account, a couple of years salary, and we planned to travel the world. That was our big plan. And we had books for travel books set. And uh, a month or two later, we, de we determined that we were pregnant. So like, or Maria was pregnant. I wasn't pregnant. <laughs> um, and Maria was pregnant and traveling the world was probably not the best thing to do with a pregnant woman. Yeah. So we decided, well, we're going to start our own business, which was the long-term plan for sure. We looked at what we wanted to do and what we enjoyed doing or, or veins of that. And uh, I had been fortunate enough to work in the solar industry when I was in college. Oh, cool. Yeah. And so we worked on solar thermal yeah. systems and we repaired systems from Jimmy Carter's days, right? And uh, there were probably a dozen people in North Carolina in the solar industry then, myself being one of them, a yeah. young- uh, I think a dozen was Or yeah, maybe not that many, but <laughs> there were a few. I and mean, there were some green builders at that time too, yeah. people building, you know, passive solar homes. And uh, right. there were, you know, four or five builders that were doing that. Uh, Richard Harkrater. I was going to say, it was like you guys and Richard. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and Fred and there, Stewart. There, yeah, Fred Stewart was- was my mentor at Solar Consultants and uh, in addition to being a dear friend of our family. But so we said, we'll try this. And uh, and in reality, you know, it took years and years before it turned into like a financially sustainable business, but we built it, you know, block by block from yeah. the bottom up. What needed to be true for the business to, to evolve, to meet cash flow, to thrive over the first five or 10 years, let alone the last 22? We needed to have um, a little bit of backup money in the bank, but there were, we, we really seeded the company, well, I think 30, 40 grand. It was really a small yeah. amount. And, uh, but it, it needed to require that I not have a salary. We not have a family salary for a couple of years. That was yeah. one thing. As long as it could like cash flow itself relatively neutral, that was fine for us. What else needed to happen was we had to find ways to continue to like slowly grow it. Yeah. So like we were fortunate enough to have an opportunity to become a HERS Raider, which is the energy efficiency half of our business. And yeah. Found a friend at Progress Energy, Hal Lawrence, who sponsored me to go through a HERS rating class uh, for free and uh, at Advanced Energy here in North Carolina, a nonprofit we still work with. Yep. And uh, we added that service. And there were builders that were interested in Energy Star then. And so, like, I was yeah. riding around in my car selling Energy Star certifications yeah. and, like, doing the inspections myself and figuring it out piece by piece. So it had to have a fledgling industry as well, I believe. And the solar thermal, we put solar panels on people's roofs for and fixed the ones that were out there as well. The state of North Carolina was one of the early adopters to a state tax credit. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did that change the dynamic? And how, how did you guys see into that opportunity or help seed that opportunity in the state? North Carolina actually had a state tax credit from, I guess, the Carter yeah, years. Yeah, from before. That, that was part paired with the federal incentives that mm. were around at that time. Yep. And so it, it just never gone away. Yeah. Yep. So we actually had a 35% state tax credit uh, up until 2016. Right. Yeah. And it really did help to support the industry. And, and again, as Bob mentioned early, it was mainly thermal yep. because solar uh, PV was what, $12 a watt? And, and is the number is the number that I economic sense, yeah. yeah that I that I quote and I think is accurate. No, I can remember like mm -hmm. quoting so because people wanted it, yeah. right? It was just exorbitantly right. even with that thirty five percent state tax credit. Yeah, and then the policy side, both for energy efficiency and for solar, has been really important. Right, because. Builders, uh, although some are really innovative and and like to do new things, many of them like to stick with what works. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Energy Star was this new thing. And oh my gosh, I have to have additional inspections. I'm going to pay somebody to come and do additional inspections. That are yeah. going to be hard. So, you know, the utility programs like such as the Hero program here in North Carolina has been really yeah. uh, mm. great. And we were the first state, was it Senate Bill 3, that required, what was that, 2008? I'm not sure the Or date. 7, that required the utility to purchase a certain amount mm. of energy from renewable sources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has been um, a driver. A driver of yeah. the industry here. Yeah. In 
That's the the PURPA regulation, right? It was the Senate Bill 3 was the first regulation that was saying, like, we need to start investing in renewable energy yeah. in North Carolina. <clears throat> PURPA was the law that was allowed the the five megawatt solar farms to really blossom. Uh -huh. Oh, and the other thing I'll say that had to be true, mm -hmm. we had to have people who are willing to go first, mm -hmm. right? Customers. Yeah, yeah. customers That's that right. had to be, you know, at the time when we started yeah. uh, and when we were, I mean, we were partnered with uh, other companies to install the first megawatt, you know, at that time we called them utility scale <laughs> right? uh, yeah. systems in many states up and down yeah. the East Coast. And so, you know, customers and, you know, our partners and, and we, frankly, had to be willing to Go first. Yeah, and figure it out. Figure it out. Figure it out along yeah. the way. Yeah. Uh, did you guys both grow up in this area? Or where Where do you call home before we moved to? Yeah, I grew up in Charlotte, so I'm a North Carolina native, and I've lived in Raleigh since I came to school in '85 here at NC State. Mm -hmm. Went to college, but yeah, well, I'm a North Carolina native. So I grew up in Virginia. And shortly after meeting Bob, he wasn't the reason I moved here. But he, <laughs> yeah, but he. The stories we tell. Yes, well, uh, but we did. And influence. Them. Yes, we mm. did. We did get together shortly after. Yeah. That. Mm -hmm. Did uh, either of you grow up in a particularly entrepreneurial family or environment? Yeah. Yeah, both of us actually. Yeah. yeah, yeah. My parents were both entrepreneurs. Um, my mom uh, was a seamstress and like sewed um, curtains and bed covers. And uh, my dad helped design the bed, the the, the headboards to beds with different oh, things wow. and uh, and different finials for curtains. And uh, they worked for interior decorators and more high end homes in Charlotte. Wow. Um, and then my dad also owned a business where they sold um, office supplies, papers, and fax machines, and things of that nature to companies as well. So yeah, pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty entrepreneurial. And my dad as well. My dad owned many different businesses. From uh, he had an ice plant where he sold ice in the summer and coal in the winter. Coal. Mm -hmm. He sold coal mm. in the winter. Yeah. And uh, so maybe I'm yeah. helping to to <laughs> heal some result, of that. Result. I don't know that he sold a lot of coal, but at any rate, mm -hmm. he, I didn't have that realization until fairly yeah. recently, actually. Wow. I don't know. It was uh, Jennings yeah. Ice and Coal plant. Yeah. And then uh, my mom ran, she had the opportunity to purchase when her uh, employers retired, she had the opportunity to purchase with two of her colleagues a uh, collection business so wow. and that was in 1983 i believe so very early woman business owner yeah yeah uh, and so i watched her really uh thrive mm. in an environment that wasn't really set up for women to thrive as an entrepreneur at that time can you speak more to that i can speak a lot more than that <laughs> um yeah, and this is where I could get emotional. My, I, I lost my mom last year. And uh, when a parent moves on, transitions, uh, it's a time in my experience. I've just done a lot of reflecting, and I think most of us do. Um, but I've reflected a lot on the lessons that I learned from her. Mm -hmm. And certainly having an impact that is broader than just the business that you do every day. I learned from her and I watched her uh, struggle quite a bit when and get letters addressed to Mr. J.D. Thacker, you know, and her getting very upset about that mm -hmm. and and really trailblazing as a female business owner in the early 80s in a relatively conservative town. Yeah. Uh, Lynchburg is not known for its progressiveness. <laughs> and uh, so she really taught me, and I didn't appreciate it really at the time, but watching her uh, both 
grow her business, support her people along the way. She was very intentional about how she uh, created a community Mm -hmm. within that organization and having people like the tradition. We have a party at our house. Mom would have her team to her home for- Christmas cookie party. Well, for meals Mm -hmm. several times a year and really uh, taught me about the humanity mm. of running a business and that's beautiful and the she had very close relationships with many of her customers her clients as mm. well and my business card says lead with love and maybe we can talk about this later yeah but she's the one who taught me that to lead with love that's very cool so i believe that everything you do in life is a building block and it allows you to develop the core skills, like the foundational skills, the pattern matching, et cetera. Were there any, at the time, opportunities that felt like dead ends or just sort of laughable jobs that you had that when you look back on it now were really formative? I've got one. Um, I worked where we built um, uh, cherry pickers, the, the the trucks that utility people go up and repair yeah. lines and things like that on. And I love that job because I worked really hard and I got to work with my hands and I like, I like working with... Uh, um, the automotive or truck industry is interesting to me, but I had one job. Um, I worked at Wendy's for one day (laughs) and, um, and it was a difficult job for me because like the, the, the manager was like, okay, now you need to go out into the parking lot and like sweep the parking lot. And so like, I did that and I'm like, well, what's next? And he's like, clean the salad bar. And I'm like, okay, clean the salad bar. He's like, well, what's next? And it reached the point where he's like, go do that again, go out the parking lot and take care of it again. And I'm like, I just did it 20, 30 minutes ago. So like, the, I couldn't work there because there wasn't the the expectations were actually too low for what for what I want. I'm like I can got to find something to do to be productive. So I'm very much of a type A personality, get things done, make a list, and so I quit that job after one day, yeah. even though I was a walking from my house, and I was like I just can't do a job where right. I don't feel like I'm doing what I should be doing, doing something. Yeah, yeah. It's a probably nonlinear but progressive transition to something that you touched on earlier that I think is a core piece of your story. And that is that uh, you were a part of the team. Like Burt's Bees in the Durham area, I'm I'm in Durham, is famous for having been really the first to take advantage of the new wave of economic development investment coming from Maine, setting up headquarters in North Carolina. It was a big deal. It still continues this day to be one of the things that the state draws on. Early in your career as entrepreneurs get to work at a company like Burt's Bees that has had been an iconic company in the the country and you left. Can you talk, talk about the decision to leave at a time when seemed like Burt's Bees was just up and to the right and your careers along with it, I would assume. Yeah, well, I'll I'll speak first. So I only worked there for a short time. Okay. So I was only there for about a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, as we reflected on that experience, we were we were both serving on the leadership team at yeah. the time, and we it was very difficult for us to do that in an environment where we had little control. Yeah. So I would Back feel defensive about part. his stuff. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would feel defensive about his stuff. He would feel defensive about my stuff. I don't think we were aware enough to really yeah. understand that. Were you married moment. at the time? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. No. He went to work there first. Yeah. He, you're, you got the job through my uh, my colleagues. I was selling business machine supplies and paper okay. and printing and that kind of stuff. And my colleague, her husband, got a job there at mm. Burt's Bees, and he hired Bob. Yeah. And then Bob, Bob, which were they? You, you had a lot of stick to itiveness with that. Or- yeah, I mean, it, um, it was fun. It was exciting. It was growing. So there was a lot to learn. Um, 10 years there was a lot. Uh, started out being a plant engineer, whatever that meant. It was 35 women that were doing handcrafts that came yeah. from Maine. Putting wax and, into tins. Yeah, yeah, putting wax into tins, exactly. And so I was pretty creative and had a good mechanical inclination and was able to take some of the things that were completely hand done mm. and halfway automate them or make them much faster, Amazing. which has been one of the things that's been, that I've worked through in many, almost any job I've had. But, um, but you know, there was a it grew a lot and uh and they they hired a mentor to work on the operation side larry gross close is a friend of our families and someone i'm in uh, you know have lots of respect for and like taught me a million things and uh 
And eventually Larry left. The owner, uh, Roxanne and Bert, um, were continued to work in the company. Bert less, much less, but then Roxanne. But Larry left, and it was a good time for me to leave. My mentor had left. There was going to be churn. Financially, we would have been better off to stay, that's for sure. The my friends who stayed uh, for another few more years and got, got, you know, when they got bought out by the first PE right. firm, um, they did really, really well. But we had we got a fair deal, and Roxanne um, um, did what she said she would do for our family, and that's where we took the money and decided we want to start our own company. Amazing. And Burt's Bees was a lot of fun, you know. It, fit, it checked our, our environmental ethic boxes, but it didn't check the boxes for the people side. It just wasn't what that company was about. How interesting. Yeah, and so like because on the outside looking in, it kind of feels like they tried to make it sound like it was. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know? you know, they didn't have they, they didn't pay for marketing basically yeah. because they didn't yeah. have any um, spokes models. Effectively, they had mm -hmm. Bert. They didn't yeah. pay, they didn't pay, <laughs> Bert didn't want the money anyway. Oh uh, yeah, they had Bert on the on the packaging, but it just wasn't a. Uh, um, the people that were there was focused on how are we going to make money and protect mm, the environment. Yeah. And that was the sole focus. Yeah. So we said, like, what can we add? What do we want to add to that? And the people component was clearly, you know, people, planet, profit. Right. Yep. So they had two pieces of it really well. Um, and mm. we thought, well, the third piece, which was the fledgling beginning of sustainability, was at the same time. And oh. we thought, well, we can do this. And, uh, and we also wanted to travel. We're both, we both love to travel. Mm. So we're like, yeah, well, let's take a year and travel. So, wow. um, yeah, it was a it was a great learning experience, and uh, and the controller that I sat with, John Fragamini, as well at Burt's Bees, is actually now helping Southern Energy Management as we have a transition in some of our financial leadership here. So yeah. I called him up, and he said, "I'll come work with you for a few months." And Super help. So, cool. Yeah, so like the people side was really great, and I learned a million things there to help run a business. So yeah, you know, it's funny we were joking uh, before we started the the camera that. Our paths have crossed in, in in funny ways. Like you and I have seen each other at shows, and somehow we've never met uh, until today. And I'm grateful for that um, opportunity today. But our stories are not that dissimilar. You guys started six years before I started my company, but back in 2007, I did in Monterey the first fully solar powered newspaper in the nation. And wow. what's yeah. what's interesting about that, and the only reason I bring it up is that it was 32 kilowatts, right? So like yeah. the yeah. largest, so you know where I'm going with this, like yeah, the yeah. largest national newspaper or the largest solar powered newspaper in the nation was 32 kilowatts. All right. yeah. yeah. And you guys in the same year installed the largest solar system in the state of North Carolina. How big was that? Is that 2007? I'm not sure. Without, it's about yeah, 30 kilowatts. 30 kilowatts right? on yeah. Delta products. Yeah. yeah. Delta products. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. 30 kilowatts. That was that. <laughs> we, thought that we thought that was like a massive, right? Yeah, exactly. That was a giant hill to climb. Yeah. yeah. And they thought so too, though. Like, holy cow. Yeah. 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 Uh, we were in the news a lot back then. Yeah. It was all <laughs> so if, as we reflect on like $12 a watt to install residential solar, 30 kilowatts was the largest system in the state of North Carolina, which became the second largest market in the United States within a span of six years from then. Yeah. Talk a bit about the landscape, like navigating the change in landscape from those early days where it was really homeowner driven. It was really first adopter driven. It was very um, uh, ethos driven through to kind of the free money decade of door knockers uh, mm. sort of in in, in coming into the Carolinas. Could you talk a bit about watching the evolution of that market and how you how you hung on or navigated that and differentiated Southern Energy Management? When we set ourselves up there, as solar started to grow, we had a great team and we were really good at the EPC side. We said the world's gonna want a high quality, you're gonna buy this thing and it's gonna last for 25 years, they're gonna want the high quality right. system, they're not gonna want the lowest price. Yeah. Well, that was totally incorrect. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and, and we were never drawn to the financial side of it. Yeah. And when you got down to it, the early solar adoption in the Carolinas was a financial, complete financial play yeah. where you needed a tax equity guy to yeah. monetize the state and the federal right. tax credits. So like you need to sit across from banks and large corporations. Yeah. That wasn't our style. Like we were wearing Crocs and like that was our thing. Um, so we thought we would be a great EPC and they'll hire us. And in the end, like that, that didn't really, that wasn't the way it flushed out in the end. Mm. So we continued to get work because we were good at what we we're doing. But the people that really harvested the the large financial were the ones that got smart about the financing side. Yeah. And so the developers effectively, and we said, they'll just keep hiring us. And in the end, the developers brought some of that in-house, a lot of them did. Yeah. And so 
it was an interesting time and and we didn't we didn't pull a ship out and put a sail up to go down there and that yeah. was probably when we looked financially at where we made you know where could we step differently to make more money that's a clear area where we could have right um and uh but but we used to continue to eke out a living and 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 make money just not the explosive growth that the Carolina saw from the five megawatt purple plants in, the, mm. in that decade. Right. I and mean, you asked earlier about our decision to not take outside investment. Yep. Yeah. I would say if we had been more savvy, uh, it would have been really smart for us to set up maybe a different company even yeah. to do the development and mm. the finance side. Right. You know, there are days when I'm just like, hmm, it's not too late. We could do. It's just not yeah. what we do. It's mm. not who we are. Yeah, yeah. We're we're about building teams of people who do great work. Mm -hmm. so. You know, in uh, 2012, you did a Solar Builder Mag interview where you talked about having done 20 megawatts of yeah. EV, Lordy. in the first 11 years, <laughs> right? Yeah. Which actually is a big number no matter how At you slice time, it. That was, that was, yeah. Right? Um, you mentioned, Maria, how critical policy was to the growth of the company, uh, even back then. How true does that hold today? And talk a bit about the nature as an energy business of being both in, uh, in bed with and in conflict with policy at, at any given time. Yeah. So we and North Carolina, one of the things that makes North Carolina a, a really interesting market, of course, all markets are, are interesting and have their own flavors, <laughs> uh, but we are in the territory of a regulated monopoly. Uh -huh. And so that is a guaranteed 12% a rate of return last yeah. time I checked. Mm. So with that being the case, yeah. policies such as Senate Bill 3, when that happened, uh, to require the utilities to make this clean energy transition, uh, it, it won't happen without it, yeah. right? Because when your biggest competitor w w does a great job and offers, you know, relatively reliable power at pretty darn cheap prices, yeah. I think we have among the cheapest power in the world, mm. you know, that that's what we're that's what we yes we both compete with them and we need to collaborate with them so they're what it, what our utilities commission uh sees fit to invest in renewable energy and the form of rebates that come from our utility mm -hmm. or when they decide that they are not going to do those really has an influence on the ups and downs of our market. And I just sort of go back to the question that you asked before. Yeah. And what that does is it creates a lot of bumpiness and yeah. what, what I refer to as frothiness uh -huh. in the market because there are a lot of well-funded um, folks who are in the solar industry because it's a hot new market right. and they want to maximize returns. Right. And so they'll say, oh, North Carolina's got this rebate. Let's parachute in mm. and, you know, offer our services. And then often just as quickly they parachute out. Yeah. Um, that ultimately is not good for the long term uh, sustainability of ju not just a market, but mm. also these systems that are some of our, our service business is actually one of our fastest growing businesses because taking care of it. Yeah. 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 Taking care of the mess left yeah. behind. Yeah. 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 How involved have you chosen or needed to be in helping craft the policy that's going to benefit your customers and the market? Because you guys have been around for so long that you've seen all the policy yeah. decisions that have been made. You've watched some who've gotten in and jockeyed for position. And maybe you've been on the sidelines. Maybe you've been in the game of that. I'm curious how you have experienced it as, as business owners. I mean, I think uh, Maria's decision to start another business to impact the impactors was was pretty directly related to the loss of the state tax credits which we fought really hard for yeah um and uh and she can tell a little bit about that mm -hmm. and i think you know the the reality of the policy in north carolina is the when the utility scale solar started to take off there was a lot of money there mm. 
And so the policy around solar got focused on that because that was where the money was and that's where the politicians were getting donations from. And so the rooftop and the DG industry that we've been focused on for 22 years was sort of the little brother to that. Yeah. Didn't really get the same sort of um, attention and, right. when you got down to it, when you get to it at a, at a, at a, um, at a legislative level. Um, and also at the NCUC, the DG is more expensive and the NC, North Carolina Utilities Commission and the public staff have been very smart in many ways to guard like more expensive power. Uh, right. So they've been much more aligned with utility scale solar as the prices have dropped. Right. Um, you know, we've continued to stay involved. NCSEA is a great trade organization that works yeah. well for policy in North Carolina for DG and yeah. has been for 20 something years. And Maria and I have both been board chairs there or, yeah. or on the board there um, and uh, and continues to be it. This last couple of years, you know, we got involved. We intervened in a case, which is the first time we did that um, for a uh, rate change that Duke, when we went from standard net metering to the next sort of iteration. We got involved in that and we, we teamed up with a couple other companies that we have a lot of respect for, you know, Yes Solar Solutions and yeah. Sundance Power and Southern Energy Management grouped together. We didn't really like the deal that had been struck by the other players in the industry in North Carolina and, right. we, and we intervened and we we negotiated in, in good faith with Duke Energy and they negotiated with us in good faith and we found a middle ground from where they had settled to where the next iteration would be. and. We're really proud about that. That's really opened up the continue to keep the market from cratering, like yeah. you've seen in California, where yeah. the market in twenty four is cratering. Like we put a put a bridge between that, a bridge rate, as it's called, actually. Now it's yeah. attention. So yeah. So um, I think the policy side is a continual thing. We're still actively involved with the policy uh, and uh, with a Republican. Um, supermajority in North Carolina, pretty much there. It's 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 a it's an uphill battle overall. But the reality of it is now that the energy prices for renewables have dropped so much, like the it's really about personal rights and it's becoming about choice. And that is not that crosses all political boundaries in in the Carolinas, in my mind. I remember the call that where it, what Bob described. It mm -hmm. became very clear that the rooftop and distributed generation was not a priority uh, in the policy realm and that utility scale was effectively uh, driving the conversation. Yeah. And What year is this? It was 2015. Okay. And it was around the state tax credit. And I mean, again, I won't go into all the gory details, but it was like the specific one little thing mm. that it all turned on and I watched it and I've been very involved in yeah. policy. I mean, yeah. I, I made countless right. trips up to DC and I was involved with national policy groups yeah. and uh, as well as state. And just in that moment, something in me, I just, mm. my heart couldn't bear the the reality that the money was what was uh, controlling everything. Mm. and. Yeah. Yeah, again, that's probably a different podcast, but <laughs> it's, it's this podcast if you want it to be. Yeah, well, yeah. but but that's the reality of the mm. world in which we live, right? Yep. Is that the those who uh, control the money control uh, the narrative, the narrative, and and not just the narrative. Well, the, well, yeah, and then the narrative controls the outcome. Well, so. it's tough loss. The tax credit, the kind of tax credits went away. The thing the utility scale sector needed stayed. Yeah how that happened and behind a door, like what happened exactly there is like to be debated. And mm. you know, some some people would say there's different narratives, but in the end, the utility scale guys continued to grow and the yeah. DG, DG teams struggled we're, for we're like the future. Yeah, exactly. We're yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Can you describe like the the days and weeks prior compared with the, like the, the company and what it looked like and then a month after that tracks credit went away, like how, the, the reality of those two businesses. You contrast those for me? Yeah, I don't remember. Sure, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I don't remember how many, I know that we had to downsize our solar team. You had, you had over 150 people. Yeah. I've read all the articles. Okay, yeah. well yeah. maybe you know the details. Better but I don't know what it, I don't know what it dwindled down to. Yeah. Well, at that time we were doing some utility scale work. Yep. So we were not, we were not four into like, oh, we're doing this work. Mm. Um, we reached a point where we realized like financially we had made a number of pretty big mistakes. Yeah. 
And in I want to be clear, this was not about the policy. Not about the policy no. at all. This yeah. was this was about this is our yeah. SCM's near death experience. Yeah. 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 And that uh, was that, as a result that, of that's really sort of the explosive thread pulling, growth. which is yeah. which is explained uh for those who are unfamiliar, the you know, the the explosive growth near death experience of SEM and how you as a couple and as a company overcame it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so they weren't directly like a month later, it didn't happen. Sure. But our utility scale solar division had grown significantly. Yeah. Um, we had great partners. We had done work with Duke Energy was one of our biggest partners. Um, and when the era money came through, mm -hmm. um, we continued to take more and more projects in yeah. states farther and farther away from more and more complicated um, general contractors yeah. and um, working for more complicated um, entities. And, and in the end, like we made a number of pretty big estimating mistakes mm -hmm. on projects, particularly in Florida, working wow. for the Navy. Um, and we also made a number of mistakes as business owners when we saw there was a lull in sales from the commercial and utility scale side in our company for about six months. Mm. And we chose to not take a lot of action internally, which was basically reduce your headcount and right. reduce your burn rate, we ended up $2 million in debt on our balance sheet. So we said, look, the what do we love to do was at the core of what our conversations were. But you know, there was like Jeff said, there were there were there was a Christmas there that was pretty pretty challenging and yeah. like bankruptcy was eminent in many for months and months and months. Um hard for a 15 year old to hear. Yeah, 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 it was. Yeah, totally. Yeah, around the kitchen table like he's learned he learned some Zach learned a lot on that. Um but we found a buyer for the utility scale solar division with Maria playing a key part in that. Maybe tell the story about how that how, no. how we got introduced to them. And that was the, is that Power Secure? Power yeah. Secure, yeah, yeah. Sure if, if you've listened to the interviews, you've probably heard it, but yeah. um, we didn't know what we didn't know yeah. at the time. Mm -hmm. And so many of the safeguards that we have since learned need to be in place mm -hmm. to run a sustainable business, we did not have in place at yeah. the time. And uh, when we found ourselves so far in debt, you asked, how did we get through it? I mean, I remember us having multiple conversations about like, well, worst case scenario, we declare bankruptcy. We go live in my mom's basement. Yeah. And Zach will have a good school system to yeah. go to. Mm. And so we got we got through it. It was actually it's one of those things, Nico, that ends up it has a silver lining or there's a blessing in it. Because I recognized at that time that if we were gonna make it through that challenge that we could make it through anything yeah, yeah. and yeah. uh and you know life is full of its own challenges so so it was really the foundation and really the decision that we were going to find a way that made sense and we did not we chose not to declare bankruptcy yeah. largely because we didn't want to leave a lot of our we were small business we had a lot of uh, suppliers that were small businesses so them. we didn't want to leave them hanging mm. And we were in the process of raising money. And I always say, you know, bless Roxanne Quimby because she was one of the first person who said, cool. who said, yeah, I'll throw some money into this thing. And we had some other dear friends and people who believed in us yeah. who uh, put together a pool of money. And the path was to continue to grow it and, and keep along the same. And who knows how that would have worked out. Yeah. But it happened that I was invited to speak on a panel on success in the clean tech space. Which yeah. It's hilarious. And, and, you know, Feel a little bit like an imposter there. <laughs> oh, just a little. <laughs> um, you know, I take every opportunity. <laughs> yeah. You're the only so, woman on the stage. <laughs> yeah. Yes. The only woman on the stage. And it was somebody who was in the, uh, re the clean energy space who had was PE backed yeah. and somebody who was publicly traded. And then we were the bootstrap company, mm -hmm. you know, and I was, uh, I was, I had to really get my courage up to go and be able to stand there or sit there and talk about our successes. But what grounded me was I knew that the Blairs of the world and mm -hmm. um, the Grahams of the world and, and the people who we had uh, helped to grow in solar like that was something that could never be taken away from us. Whatever Legacy. happened, yeah, yeah. No. And so it just so happened that the guy sitting next to me was Sidney Hinton from Power Secure, and I didn't know this at the time, uh, but you know he had a little 
he had a, a little bit deeper uh, pocket. Yeah, a little deeper pocket, and and you know one of his strategies was to buy distressed companies. Yeah, we were certainly distressed. We were distressed <laughs> at the time. So, so, but it was great because we mm -hmm. had the good fortune, and Bob and I really did a lot of soul searching to be able to divest the part of the business which had become very commoditized. Yeah, and had become and was only going to continue to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. And then focus on, we decided on our, with our team, like we really wanted to focus on where we could have more of a direct impact mm -hmm. with our customers and our builders and, and really work with people instead of spreadsheets. You know, it was a difficult time. Uh, we owed Trina a lot of money um, for a long time. I got to know their lawyer really well. Um, and we managed through it by, um, by paying our debts off little by little. Um, the power secure purchase of our utility scale uh -huh. division. All the people left, there was about 150 people there. We were left with 65 people yeah. roughly. Wow. And there were three or four people that probably didn't get the greatest deal they could have, but it was very few people were left without an opportunity to move forward in the renewable space. And power secure was gonna be able to grow the solar. So all those people that went, like they had yeah. bright futures and a, a well-functioning, a well-backed company for the growth that seemed to be in front of the utility scale solar, that, that all, that didn't work out for them the same way they had thought it was, but we were distressed and like, uh, um, but we were left with, when we looked at what we, what, what the opportunity was, the customers that we were working with were the people we wanted to work with. Right. Like when we looked at what do we like to do and what do we not like to do, forget the debt. But like, it's no fun to negotiate with a purchasing manager on a US, on a Naval Air Force base about a stainless steel screw in a, 180 page yeah. you know, specifications document. Um, so we didn't like that. That was not our thing. We weren't a big, we weren't a big change order company, which was the way you made money in that business. Right. We didn't like that. We we're like, you're gonna buy something, it's the right price. Here's what it is. Um, so in the end, like we loved who we were working with on the DG side and the builder side. And many people told us to lose your energy efficiency division. There's no reason to have that. Oh yeah. Why it's only making you a million dollars. It's a million dollars and your commercial construction, the EPC work is a 20 million. Why would you even keep this? Be good at one thing. And we said, no, we like this stuff. We like this. We like the people that are working there. We're having an impact. So we kept it. And like in the end, like thank the Lord that we did because right. that was what we've continued to focus on and grow for the last, you know, 15 years. I'd like to spend some time talking about the company culture. The more I speak with past employees, like you know, mentioned Blair Kindle as an example, who speak highly of the company, they don't talk about the accolades of all the many megawatts you installed. They talk about the family. And you guys refer to it as the Kingery family. When I, when I read articles and your company has what was described as well by our friend Craig as a unique culture. I'd like to understand how'd you build it? Why was that important? And how has it helped so that Southern Energy Management and your team feel like a family. Well, we started with a few simple rules, like we're not going to hire any assholes. That was one of our <laughs> That's rules. a great one. <laughs> but we refined those pretty quickly. We have a few flip in, but <laughs> mm. they, don't, they don't tend to last. We, we stand for something versus standing against something was a couple oh, of this one of the core one. starter oh. tenants. So like we weren't against a utility, we were for renewable energy as yep. an example. and. Mm -hmm. Not against but, nuclear. Yeah, not that. against nuclear. We were for renewables, yeah. in whatever form that was, energy efficiency and renewables. So, but but then past that, it, it evolved quite a bit. So I don't know. Speak a little bit. I'm sure you've got. Yeah, I would say initially it was more accidental, mm -hmm. uh, or it was unintentional. Let's put yeah. it that way. And we really it came from our core beliefs and I think the experience as Bob mentioned Bert Spees and what we learned there it was really uh, from watching that company grow from a values led mm -hmm. place I mean really placing uh, and decision making yeah. around a care for the environment that was an amazing uh, lesson that you know, you don't really get a chance to learn in school. And then we, like many people, from some of the challenges that we encountered, we responded to them in a way that led us to 
really double and triple down, if you will, on our culture. Yeah. And I don't know if the camera can see the, the core values yeah. right behind oh, you yeah. there. Core values. But I would say I would say when we got really serious and intentional about the behaviors. Yeah. Not just words on a behaviors. sheet of paper, yeah. but the behaviors that we wanted to see. Uh, basically, I think of core values. We think of core values as agreements mm. for how we're going to be together, how we're yeah. going to work together. And so every conversation, every interview, every uh, we have quarterly conversations with yeah. all of our team. We don't, but each uh, manager has regular conversations with their team members. Yeah. So it's really about investing in the <coughs> relationships yeah. and making it very clear about this is what we stand for and our yeah. mission up there, improving the way people make and use energy. Yeah. I, if we we start with, you've heard, I'm sure, the phrase culture eats strategy for yep. breakfast. Um, if you start with people who care about what you're looking to create in the world and they share your values, then the rest uh, is much easier. Yeah. What I've also found about this, uh, doing a lot of what you have leaned into, um, which is working with executives to help them build teams that uh, have a purpose, is defining those core values. And a lot of companies get this wrong. Mm -hmm. But when it's this clear, not only are you able to allow your core values to speak through the decisions you make, i.e. someone says something to another employee and instead of you criticizing their character or behavior, you can simply say, this doesn't align with our core value of seeking solutions, yeah. right? If you're criticizing, you're not seeking solutions, you're creating problems, yeah. right? And you can turn to core values as, as a stronghold and, and it, it often, and I'm sure this has happened, gives your employees power mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. to hold a mirror up to you. I mean, in the end, like company culture is an interesting sort of like, what is company mm -hmm. culture? And, yep. you know, the word that comes up for SEM when you do the word mapping is fun. Mm -hmm. And so I, sometimes- Enjoy the like, journey. It, yeah, enjoy the journey. Exactly. It's like a require. it's like one of the requirements. And, but reinforcing that and, and doing that again and again, it took us quite a while to get to where we are. And, and every year we challenged them and we've done some tweaks in the last five years mm -hmm. uh, um, to make them clearer and, to, and when people- To make it an acronym. Questions. Yeah, well, yeah, no, that, that was <laughs> yeah, early. We that, 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 that was early, that was early. Cheeky but, uh, that way. You gotta have an acronym. You know, you got some, <laughs> that's a business thing to shine, shine on. Um, but reinforcing them constantly is a big part of it. And so that means when I'm doing a communication to the team and I'm gonna call someone out, I'm gonna refer to a core value. There you go. And then and if I see someone that's not in a spot where they want to be or a manager's asking mm -hmm. them questions, I would be like, "What? how does that relate to our core values? Yeah. And so grounding people back in those is a big part of how to take a medium-sized team like we have and use that. But when you're small, it's really a matter of like face-to-face -face and talking to people like, hey, look, do you, and when you interview somebody and when you get them on board, like, are they living these and, and, and reinforcing those soon, um, you know, rather than letting someone slip mm -hmm. for six months. And then all of a sudden you're like, Hey, this guy's kind of a, everyone around him thinks this person's a jerk. I wanted to ask how core values are integrated, but you just answered that so eloquently that I'm going to skip to something that I think it is, I, I think I picked up on in a conversation you were having, but I've observed entrepreneurs that get past a million. They're looking to grow to 10, 20, 100 million. They not only seek um, coaching and advice, but they start to build an, an internal operating system for the company, right? So when did that moment occur formally for you guys where you decided like we need to actually formalize and operationalize what we do and how we teach it? And how do you, how is it packaged? Is there a framework that you've adopted and how has it impacted the growth of the company since then? Jeff Greenfield introduced us to a coach that did Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. Yeah. A business operating system. Mm -hmm. And we needed that. We knew we needed it because um, yep. for a variety of reasons. Is that years right? ago? Yeah. yeah part. That's Gazelles. Was, That's like way back. Yeah, yeah it's Gazelles. Gazelle, way, yeah, it's, it's like, like, I don't know, 20, 
I've, 12? I tell, was it, I mean, was Vern it Harnish, right after the Yeah, year? Vern Harnish is like at the top of my list of books that we recommend, yeah, but yeah, it's a second book, right? It's it's after Rock Yeah, Rock Astro Master Rock, yeah, yeah. Vern Harnish. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that was the very beginning of that. And then, um, but it's iterated numerous times since then. Mm. Um, and Maria has, has has a great interest and has, has iterated our team's operating system um, yeah. 10 times easily. So, but that was the very beginning. And then after cool. that. And then we did, remember, then we did balance scorecards. Oh, yeah. We did balance scorecards. Had a, bit, yeah. had a consultant come in and we yeah. did balance scorecards. Did that feel like it was a little too formal for the for the company you had or was no, it ta- right it was timing? A, it was a massive failure. <laughs> yeah, that and one then, did, the balance yeah. scorecards didn't work out at all. Yeah. 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 I, I was learning balance scorecard in grad school in 2003. Yeah, and then yeah. the next thing we did this thing called Hoshin Conry. Don't know that one. Uh, well, I, it means the golden compass. Okay. And Iron I, compass. I, I thought it was golden. Yeah. I wouldn't yeah. have gone for iron. It was a, ja- it was a anyway. Toyota. Yeah. Well, derivative of lean. Yeah. Lean. And we did some lean. And, you know, we've, we've, we've done a lot of yeah, things. And lean. then after our near extinction event, <laughs> uh, we joined an organization called Entrepreneurs Organization, EO. Yeah. Yeah. And one of my very first meetings with my forum, one of my forum mates who seemed really happy and like he was really <laughs> enjoying his life, was talking about this thing called EOS that yeah. he was using. And so I was like, oh, what is this? Mm. And he was kind enough to invite Bob and I actually both went to a level 10 meeting, you know, mm-hmm. it's a big thing in EOS. And we went and I walked in and I saw the way that team was interacting mm-hmm. and I was hooked. And so, you realize this is if this is this is a real life I want in it exactly. I was like, this is amazing, and so <laughs> this is now a commercial for EOS. <laughs> well, it is. And, and, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're not the only. You're, you're not the only company that I've interviewed that's implemented successfully EOS yeah. and 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 praises. Yeah, and then I worked myself out of a job essentially because of EOS. Because of EOS, mm. yeah, and largely because we got clear on these things. Yes. Yeah. And we got and the team we built and the team that we built. Did it take hiring an implementer to do that, or were you able to like read the books and? No, we did hire an implementer, Walt Brown. We were yeah, Walt Brown, yeah, yeah. uh, Who's still a dear friend? How big of a company do you need to have before you really can apply or embrace EOS? You've been in all sizes. I don't want to talk about EOS that much because I don't do EOS. I know, but I want to. I know, but there are (laughs) for a business operating system. But there are folks that that like I ask myself a question like. How big should I be before I decide to become a B Corp? How big should I be before I think about frameworks like EOS? For an, for an operating system? Yeah. I think every any size. any size company, you should start yeah. with an operating system. Yeah. I'm working with a startup now with three founders, yeah. and they are getting tremendous value mm. out of having yeah. an operating system. Cool. Because, like again, and for us, the, the transformational moment when we first started was we got clear on our accountabilities, yeah. right? What do you really, and, and the value that we both brought to the business, business yeah. yeah and like it was very clear that he's the guy who runs the business day to day and that i played more of a role in our values and mm, more visionary. strategic vision. yeah more vision long term yep. and visionaries can kind of get in the way yeah. of a business day to day tell me about it so i stepped out <laughs> and then i didn't know what to do mm. And our implementer at the time was like, you know, you really are good at you getting this stuff. So mm-hmm. you're maybe, good with people. And maybe you do this thing. Yeah. So and I did thing. become an EOS implementer. Yeah. So I was an EOS implementer for five years. Mm-hmm. And uh, they made some changes to their business model yep. and moved to a franchise. And, yep. you know, we talked a little earlier about how I'm not so big on Not control. an employee, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unemployable. Yeah. Right? yeah. So I decided, I didn't, I didn't want to be a franchise. Right. And also I'd always been doing things kind of my own way. Yeah. And bringing in elements that I've learned from Very cool. other sustainable business practices. Mm. Yeah. Bob, how has that uh, improved, changed, uh, how do you think about the evolution of not just your business relationship, but your marriage since then? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> um, you know, with Maria as a visionary and me as a sort of the implementer and and, and getting things moving, um, we had friction when we would walk into a meeting and we're working on how we're going to accomplish this one goal. And she would say, well, what about the goal three goals after that one? And like, then the conversation completely degrades into right. something totally different. So, um, 
you know, Maria and I are able to work through a lot of different challenges in our life in an open way and be able to communicate pretty well. And, you know, we've looked for outside help on occasion when we get stuck for that. Um, yeah. And uh, but in the end, like we're aligned to what our family's goals are. And so um, the operating system frees us to do what we do best. Yeah. Both of us. And so I would say that has definitely helped our marriage is a great question. Nigga. Um, <laughs> and uh, and it, but but as much as anything, it's like. Where, what positions do we play and when do we play them and what are the roles? It's helped make that really, really clear for us. I like which, that. Which is, you know, which is the foundation of a successful, how to run a business. Mm. You made a decision more than a decade ago to do something that a lot of companies are falling in line and following suit to do, which is to elect to become a certified B Corp or at least elect to be a public, uh, public benefit corporation. Is this certification used as a metric to guide internal company decisions or does it have external marketing benefits or both at the time when the b corp when the b lab started the b the, the just be certified b corp mm -hmm. it was the time where we were selling programs to builders energy star you check these boxes and you get an energy star sticker yeah nahp green there were six or seven different programs at the time and and there was a couple other sustainability programs that were coming up to become sustainable right. business um Maria was the advocate in the beginning for the B Corp, and it was kind of like, oh, look at all these other ones. Let's see who's going to be the winner. But but we chose to go down the path. Maria was pretty insistent that this was really important, and it wasn't. It was important for me as well. <clears throat> but we chose to do it, and um, and the reality in my mind is that B Corp certification does two things for us. Mm -hmm. The main thing it does for us is the reality is internally, like we have people that want to join our team because we're a certified B Corp, right? And that's a motivator for people once they're on the team, like, oh, we're a B Corp and like we do these things. Yeah. So people are proud. They sit around the Thanksgiving table and they're proud of where they work, yeah. no matter what they do here. Yeah. And so being a B Corp in my mind is much more about internal recruiting, motivation. And, and when you get someone that believes in those things, they're aligned on these core values as well. So like it's a filter that brings more people aligned with our core values and our mission as well. Um, externally, not so much. We hear people that say, oh, it's not worth doing. You know, consumers don't buy from us because we're a B Corp compared mm -hmm. to a um, compared to a non B Corp on a solar side often, but, but they resonate with those core values as well and what B Corp's about. So right. internally, I think has lots of tangible everyday value. Yeah. Externally, you know, I don't think many customers buy from us when we're the same price because yeah. of that, but maybe, maybe there's some of that. Yeah. That's, that's personally, but mm -hmm. right. In uh, 2022, speaking to the retention mechanism of being a B Corp, you guys were listed as, uh, li on the list of best places to work among 475 other closest yeah, friends totally, yeah. uh, across the United States. Uh, and you promote, as we've discussed here, a balanced work environment uh, in your uh, all hands from the, uh, from the article I read for getting the award of best workplace. You pointed to one of your core values, Sim, yeah. is a journey, not a destination. We sort of have this continuous iteration. We choose what we focus on as a business, and at our core, it's choosing to do business as a force for good. What does this environment look like for your employees day to day? Even though Bob is actually with them more day to day, I will <laughs> share my observations, which... Um, and, and what we have very intentionally drawn. So we talked a little bit about our operating system and what that enabled us. We, didn't, we haven't talked about the details, but ultimately mm -hmm. what our operating system enables us to do is have much more distributed decision-making and yeah. much more inclusive leadership. Yeah. So team members... Every team member has an opportunity to attend a meeting regularly where they get to raise the issues that mm. are important to them. Right. So when there's a there's a level of responsibility that we expect from people, like this is generally whatever the role is, this is not a place where you're just going to show up and, you know, is this the case of a solar installer, strap your ropes on and go up on a roof yeah. and, and, like, and, that, and then come down and that's it. It's really like, how do we, we are a continuous learning organization. We want to constantly be getting better. And we have always, I think from the very beginning, realized that the people who know best how to improve the business are those who are closest to the roles. 
So that's one way that, um, and then I do think we have a very high level of um, engagement with our B Corp values as yeah. well. I mean, people, um, we have a B squad is what it's referred to as. And I yeah. think there's 13 people that serve on this from across the company who then go to their teams and get feedback and information from their teams about how to improve the company from a sustainability standpoint. Again, it's not, we're, as we mentioned before, we're a benevolent dictatorship at this point. Um, what are, what are you, can you have two dictators, though? What does that mean? I don't know if that's the right term for this one. And I don't know, I but at any rate, we won't, we won't get to, but, but at any rate, there, we hope, and what our goal is, one of the things that I tell our team all the time, I do our new hire orientation, um, is that whatever period of time they're here, we want them not just to grow professionally, but we want them to grow as humans yeah. as well. And so I think there's, for people who really embrace that, mm. there's an opportunity, not to talk about bringing your whole self to work and your humanity to work. And I think that, that this is a place where we are really endeavoring to live into those mm. uh, principles and a, very tangible and meaningful and day-to-day -day way. Yeah. And I can, I'll build on that. Um, we have five income producing divisions effectively under the hood of Southern issue management as a, as a corporation <clears throat> and each of the leaders, each of those have leaders and every one of those leaders started in a field position. Everyone, every one of them, every single person started in a field position mm. and which is really interesting and just goes to show like when you show up here, we say, look, we're going to challenge you to show up with more than just like you get paid by the hour to do what you're doing and you do it and that's fine. So the people that have risen are the people that have showed up with more than that. <clears throat> and they see that. And so like, it's really interesting to sit in an interview for Brinson Fuller runs our solar um, teams yeah. and he sits in there and he says, look, 10 years ago, I was in, I was you. Yeah. And those people look at that and are like, holy cow. And, they, and, our, and our field manager says, five years ago, I was you. Right. And so, but it, but it also separates the people, like the opportunities there and not everyone's in a spot in their life where they can bring a whole lot more, but the ones yeah. that do, they see the opportunity for what goes forward. And I'll say one other item to build on our company sort of in respect to the culture and the enjoy the journey is we have an internal training called SEM University, great program, but it's not all about just business, how to read a P&L or how to do a lean event or things like that. We have a class that's, you know, how to have a difficult conversation. And how do you have a difficult conversation? Like people walk out of there and they're like, wow, when I go to Thanksgiving, I'll be able to talk to my sister who I don't agree oh, with wow. on 16 different levels, right? Yeah. And uh, and um, so, and then there's another class on the drama triangle where you show up as a victim or a bully and and, and Maria could in, in, add more on top of that. But, uh, but ultimately like we do those things because we think that, these are skills in life. And like, we want our team to be able to have a difficult conversation. If like someone yeah. pissed you off, like how do I talk to them in a way that's not saying you're an asshole, right? That's beautiful. That's what we want. Wh where do these trainings come from? You create them? Yeah, oh, well, yeah, Maria Maria has been the, been the yeah, primary creator. Yes, I mean how to have a difficult conversation. Yeah, it's like five modules that you invented. Yeah, I mean it's pull from different places. Yeah, pull from different places. Yeah. You you do this work sure. as well, right? Yeah. So I we uh, and I in particular, and for the last eight years, have been a student of what works and what mm. doesn't work. Yeah. And so there's crucial conversations, you know, radical candor. There's a bunch of different resources yeah. that that I've pulled from and created a framework. And then, you know, our team, one of the big things we did last year for, for quite a while, it was me teaching a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Now we're, we're teaching other leaders cool. in our organization to teach them as well. Very cool. And so, um, yeah, yeah. It's a but big part of it. it comes from, we pull from, just like with our operating system, right? We pull some from uh, Jim Collins, some Keep from Vern Harnish, some yep. from Gina Whitman, some from Michael Gerber. You know, what works is what works. Yeah. And so it's not one thing, but we mm. are able to pull from a variety of different resources yeah. to create something that we 
believe is unique to us. I love that because a lot of folks are afraid to throw away the things that don't work. They think, oh, but this system worked for them. It should yeah. work for me. And they feel like I'm a bad entrepreneur because I can't implement this thing. Right. Exactly. Like this, this. Yeah. Way. This checklist. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's a lot of freedom, freedom that, that you can give people when they realize, no, it it's very business and personality dependent. And the culture that you set may not be the same culture they wanted in their company. Exactly. And if like, I mean, almost, uh, almost in entirely, right? The, the culture, just pick two companies here locally that are completely different, like polar opposites um, is like Strata and Southern Energy Management, yeah. right? The way that the companies are run, um, they've, they've both accomplished incredible things, yeah. right? But what works for Marcus and the Strata team would never work for Solar Energy. Nah. So that would not. Yeah, very and, different. And vice versa. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'll give you that. I'll give know. you that, Marcus. You should, maybe, maybe yeah. a little more love. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, that's my Marcus bias. has a that's vision for, bias, for right. what his company is. He does, and he's got a strong vision. He does. And uh, and and the company ends up follow, following out of that. But you bring up a good point, like. Companies are going to follow their leaders. Yes. So, like, if I don't show up and join the journey, then, like, my team that reports to me isn't going to show up and join the journey. And, right. you know, there's days where that's not easy, right? And there's days where I'm like, look, I'm not coming into the office today because I'm not enjoying anything. Right. So, like, I'm not going to show my head in there and mm, have to pretend. And, and there's days where I'm like, this is a tough day for me. Like, I, I'm don't want to poison the well. And being honest about people. So, yeah. but each entrepreneur sets their own tone, I believe, is, is for sure. Yeah. yeah. You guys have been creative. Uh, as we walked in, I commented on what, for all intents and purposes, is a podcast booth. And I can tell you, we work with a lot of, like, my, my friends at Nextamper calling, going, how do we set up a podcast booth, right? And you guys already have one, not only set up, but working, and you're producing from it. And I think that that's something that very early on, you all adopted social media. You integrated it in to, uh, into the, the marketing strategy of your company. How are these efforts managed both internally and, and through you all to the sales team. Can you talk a bit about like in an era where literally started the company before Facebook or even Google really existed, you've watched Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, all of them have come, have evolved. How do you think about marketing in an age where like you're in your specific sector, leans heavily on financing and door knocking and on maybe not so honest ads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we've never been a financing or a door knocking company. It just yeah. seems, it just grates us in the same way we are not a utility scale company. Yeah. Like we just don't feel like that's the, we don't feel like that's the best way to reach the customers we want to reach. Mm -hmm. And I mean, at a core level, we hire people that are really smart about how to do those things on our marketing team and give them the rope to do that is a silly answer to your question. Like, mm. how have we been successful there? Um, cause I can't lay claim that I'm a TikTok expert at all. Do they come to you with I'm, crazy ideas? Um, yeah, they do. Yeah. We, we, we did a couple this last year. We did a, uh, we did a, uh, we're going to bring an ice cream truck into a neighborhood and give away free ice cream uh -huh. in a neighborhood. We've had some solar and, and that worked good until they parked it across the street from a high school when the high school <laughs> let out. <laughs> so like, yeah, and they never turned to any sales, but so we, they, we do let them, they have a good rope to, yeah. to move forward and, and do the things that they feel like are smart. And, uh, it's more expensive and harder to get to customers the way we do it. You know, door knocking works. Yeah. And, and and that's why people do it. Um, and it lowers your cost of acquisition. So people do it that way. We just don't feel like that's our way. Um, the great the broader issue around solar, residential solar sales is we can we can talk more about that. But but I don't know, on the marketing side, you know, we've got we've got smart visionaries there and they they touch base with us, but in reality, I find that they give them the rope, give the smart people the rope, mm. teach them what we're doing and how we're doing it and, and let them run with it. Mm -hmm. Marie, you may have a totally different point of view on this one. Well, I think, yeah. So we have um, our team operates with budgets, uh -huh. right? Yeah. So again, they've got accountability for what they or they are responsible for yeah. meeting the needs of the business based on the budget yeah. that they have. And so to yeah. Bob's point, they're really smart about figuring out how are we going to do that. Yeah. And so that's sort of yeah, the tactical side. Yeah. But then on the more, you know, non-tactical side, um, 
we really have leaned into showing who we are as a company. Yeah. Because many, many things can be duplicated. And we have, just recently, Bob was telling me about an interaction he had with a, another a local competitor who apparently their marketing firm just totally stole our, like, duplicated our marketing campaign, like, word for word. Wow. And so that kind of thing happens. Yeah. Um, but they can't be us, uh -uh. okay? Yep. So as soon as they pick up a phone and they call and they speak with a member of our team, we believe that's where the differentiator mm, comes in. Yeah. And so our marketing team, who shares our values and mm. believes in our mission, just to tell our story. I mean, you're a storyteller, Nico. You get that, right? Totally. Yeah. So you tell the story and then you let the, hopefully for, for again, we're not going to be perfect for everybody. Yeah. Um, we believe in doing high quality work that's going to last, you know, 30, 40 years. Who knows how right. long we've got. Um, so we're not going to be the cheapest in the market. We're not, we're also, those door knockers, they thrive on high pressure sales. Yeah. You know, you're not yeah. going to get that from us. Right. Like you're not sign now, sign here, yeah. sign today kind of thing. Um, you're going to get educated. And... What, are, what are some ways then that you guys are educating the consumer to counteract the high pressure sale? What are, like I saw, for example, on your website, you have kind of 17 questions that yeah. every owner has about the Tesla Powerwall, yeah. right? How do you think about getting in front of the customer when you're not knocking on their door? Yeah, I mean, it's about education, like you're saying. So like we spend a lot of time internally, like how do we, how does our sales team communicate to the customer? Yeah. How do they how does the technical team support the sales team to get yeah. the answers that the consumers are asking when you show up there as a yeah. technical person? So it's a lot of education. Um, we do a lot of events as well, which are, um, oh, we're going to go into a homeowner who's had a successful solar install and we're going to show how we did it and what right. does their battery do and how does it work? And so a lot of on-site education, commercial and residential. Are you recording well. that as well? Uh, not as much as we could, for sure. It's more of a one-by-one -one with the sales team. Yeah. Um, some of that. Um, and then we do neighborhood areas where we do similar things where it's a neighborhood promotion slash yeah. education event. Um, like a neighborhood party kind of thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, those are some of the ways that we do that. But in the end, it's about education, the blogs, the website. When someone calls on the phone, like our inside salesperson will spend 30 minutes talking to you. Lots of companies are like, let me set an appointment, get yeah. a sales guy at your house, boom, right. give you 10 minutes, boom, boom, done. He's like, what are your questions? Inside sales is trained to educate Start asking and qualify. questions. Yeah, our inside salesperson was an outside salesperson for five years, didn't like the monthly grind. Yeah. Has been a, a solar on his roof for a decade and worked here for over a decade total. And he's like, I just want to talk to people because I have solar on my roof and I wow. love them. Yeah. And so he can answer just about any question about it. He could do the interview with you probably. Uh, yeah. So yeah. That's cool. I'd yeah, like to do that. Yeah. And so like there's 30, it's, it's like you know, spend 30 minutes on the phone with somebody. Yeah. Which is you call some other company and it's not likely they're going to show you that no, same a different KPI. respect. Mm. Yeah. What recently or over, over history or maybe recently when presented with evidence of the contrary, have you changed your mind about? I would say one thing that I've changed my mind about is that structure and, dare I use the word, hierarchy mm -hmm. and authority is stifling. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we talked about, we yeah. don't we don't want it on us, but, but for years, like, I just didn't, I, I, I personally was really resistant to- To hierarchy. Hierarchy. And, and structure in yeah. an organization because mm -hmm. I felt like it, it um, I'd seen it in extremes, mm, right? So yeah. there's a balance there. So I've changed my mind on that. I'm much yeah. more. And also the other, one of the other things I've changed my mind about is uh, that once someone joins our, I actually don't like the word family okay. because I think it's, I think it's, I don't think family's it's, usually dysfunctional. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, also don't think it's, I don't think it's fair in some ways. Like yeah. we have a, mm -hmm. we have a community of yeah. people, I believe, I hope, but I used to, for years, if you came here, you were going to be a lifer. So that was my, right. that was what I wanted. And I were now, mm -hmm. I've changed my mind. Some people like are going to come and go. 
I've changed my mind on how much rope to continue to give people and to, and to let them continue to make mistakes. I, I feel like that's an area where I would jump in soon. When I, whenever I saw something course going off course, I would jump in with wow. my thoughts. And now I don't do that as much as I just continue to ask more questions. Yeah. The more I give up, the more that people want to get to grab. So a good example is like, we like to travel. So we're traveling family and, and so mm. two or three weeks away, like I might feel disconnected, but the team, when I get back, they're like, oh, we did this, we did this, we did this, we did that. So like the more rope I give and the less I check in, yeah. often the more results, the more people feel like they have the ownership and they mm. move the ball forward. Yeah. So there's something that I've learned. Forcing function to get yourself out of the way. Yeah. Totally. And, and give the team the business. And give the team some room. Some yeah. ways, yeah. 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 Mm. Mm -hmm. I have boiled down my leadership philosophy to three words. Mm. And it's connect, commit, and celebrate. Yeah. And if you do those things over and over and over again, and there's a lot of different th aspects to each one of those, but like connecting with people and then making strong commitments mm -hmm. slash agreements and then celebrating when we win and when we don't. Mm. I think in doing that in a very... Celebrate the effort. Yeah. And you do it in a systematic way and very intentional way. I think it's really simple. Mm. Well, among the pieces of advice that you could offer small business owners in particular, that's a really good one. I feel like we've given a lot of tangible takeaways here. Uh, build strong relationships and think long term was the advice that I heard you give a lot a decade ago. And it seems that that is still core yeah. to the the essence, as it were, of Southern Energy Management. Yeah. yeah, we have the same leaders running the company as we had 10 years ago. What are some of the big shifts that you see coming with regards to sustainable energy uh, in the next five to 10 years that you're helping prepare your team and your customers for? I think the world of residential and distributed generation solar is, you know, got challenges in the way that we've approached customers. Yeah. That we've seen a decent amount of press around uh, high pressure sales, 25 year loans. I think the, the the race to get that pile of money to make the the grow 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 has proven to be really a big challenge at the consu at the customer level as much as the company's levels. I mean, 2024 we're seeing people that are projecting large amounts of residential solar installers to go out of business yeah. mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. So, um, so but some of the so I think that that will hopefully fundamentally change some of the customer relationships and customer experiences, which we yeah. feel like are somewhat inferior or overpromised and under delivered in the long term with companies that are not really looking after 25 years of customers um uh customers goodwill and what they really need and what they're promising them um on the technology front i think uh vehicle to grid i think is really coming yeah. i think that's going to happen like we're Very sold cool. you know we just installed our thousandth power wall but like i think that the i think that we'll see the the your vehicle your car will become the power wall of your home and your backup power we said that for two years now, but it's coming, and we got a couple of you all listed. Well, I said it ten years ago. Yeah, I thought I was nuts. So, yeah. but that's okay. I'm yeah. used to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. Rare may have been an early profit on that one for sure. I think that's a big thing coming. Other than that, I think um, in North Carolina market, a big thing coming is like, what can you do behind the meter? Behind the meter. Behind the meter. Yeah. What can I do on my house behind my meter? And what does the does the utilities? reach go behind the meter into my house right many states that's really clear north carolina it's not completely clear yeah the utility has a point of view that's different than some of the consumer side of it and consumer advocates and so i think that's a really big one in north carolina in the next two to three years as well it's clear that you both have spent a lot of time uh in personal development uh in corporate development and and helping each other helping others with what you've learned uh is there a book or books that teen, tend to rank sort of higher on the list of recommendations for you, be that leadership or just general enjoyment for reading. I believe that readers are leaders and leaders are readers. And I'd love to have you share with our viewers some of the things that have helped you in your life. Maybe they've shifted something, you know, like a black swan kind of book, or maybe they fundamentally changed the way you thought about business. So one of my favorite books that really, I think, is, is a business book, but it also has 
personal implications. It's called The Art of Possibility. Mm. And I highly recommend it on Audible mm. because it's, um, I will forget the the names of the people. Um, but at any rate. Uh, Benjamin Zander. Yes. And, and Rose, Rose Mon. You got it. Yes. Going. And he is a conductor. And she, they have worked together and they do have done a lot of coaching and things. And then their approach is just really interesting. And if you listen on the Audible in particular, like you get to hear the Sim symphony. Go, oh, really? And so it's just a oh, beautiful, cool. beautiful. Uh, another that. book that I'm a huge fan of is the 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. Oh, such a good book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great book. Yeah. Oh, our, man. Our, team is so that's reading like a that. lifetime of that's a lifetime of learning I've, that one. I've listened and read it probably a dozen times and yeah. still get something every time mm -hmm. I read it um and you know I have to mention Brene Brown dare to lead she the way she breaks things down simply and then I would be remiss if I didn't say you know traction and and what, of course. what Gino did yeah which was brilliant, just packaging so many different people yeah. into one little package. Yeah. And, and Traction, for those who are unfamiliar, is kind of the seminal book on how to implement or how to think about entrepreneur operating system, the, the framework that he gave to sort yeah. of the way a business can run more successfully. Yeah. Yep. I would, I've heard folks recommend Rocket Fuel as like a predecessor, though, like if you really want to. So Rocket Fuel, when you have visionary founders, um, who well i have my own, i have my own theories about what yeah. about the whole visionary integrator relationship yeah. but yeah if if you if it's clear that you've got a visionary founder and then uh maybe not so strong on the operational on the side yeah. uh it's a great book cool. for folks to i mean it's it's a lot like the e myth i mean that, that oh, yeah. concept mm -hmm. of like know when to get out of the way yeah um, yeah, it's, yeah. I, yeah, I kind of see Rocket feel that way as well. It's like a wake up call for the yeah. for the the visionary founder that yeah. has not a clue how to run the actual day to day operations of the business and still mm -hmm. wants to be involved. Yeah, yeah. Well, you gotta find your place. I go to a totally different level. Um, my favorite book of all time is The Lives of the Cell. The Lives Lives of a Cell, and it's a book on um, it's a book on like life. On is Earth. this notes of a biology watcher? Yep. No exactly. way. Yeah. I've sure. never. Nobody's ever recommended this. Yeah. One. <laughs> and it's a and it's a it's a book that yeah good. Uh, when the Lewis I, Thomas. Lewis yeah. Thomas. Yeah. Lewis Thomas. Yeah. And it's a book around like it's talking about life on Earth and yeah. and, and when you get down to it, what that means for me is like we're I'm a part of life on Earth and uh, and and human beings are a part of my belief is a part of evolution on earth and but there's a there's a binding like life in and of itself is a binding force that we're all a part of and and that book tends to make me when I've, I've picked it up and reread it and recommended it to lots of younger people but it helps me feel like I can find my place when I get concerned about something about me or my oh mm. my gosh what about this or what about that and is this right or wrong it's like we're a part of something much, much bigger than what what I am. And in doing that, like I can help me feel much more comfortable in my own self, no matter how I feel or what what's going on. So mm -hmm. yeah, at a biological level, that grounds me, so to speak. As a married couple, for those of us running a business with our with our better half. Are you doing that too? Oh my yeah, gosh. Sweet. Bless you, dear child. Bless, yeah, bless her. She's got a yeah. Uh, we 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 may need a, a couple some couples therapy. Yeah. So um, we've done it three times. <laughs> uh, how do oh, you, I thought what, you get what boundaries? Which I think is the right word. What boundaries did you learn to place around the business and personal mm -hmm. journey so that you maintain a healthy work and private life? I'm not so sure that we have healthy boundaries because I feel like work is life life. When we when we focused our work around something that is impactful in life, I feel like they intertwine in a way that I don't like the work life balance mm -hmm. discussion. Even I feel like mm -hmm. that's a misnomer to start. Like I feel like that's just the wrong place to start. So more about integration. Yeah, How you integrate those things. Yeah. So I would say that we probably have not been the best model for like here's the boundaries. Our son would say we're not good at that at <laughs> all. He would say like every yeah. every dinner he can please stop talking about Southern Energy Management. Yeah. What our son would say when he was young. Um, but I feel like it's really more about like 
how do we find other interests that we're interested in and yeah. that we both love to do? And so like those take our time because we're interested in them versus how do we set a boundary on when we talk about Southern energy management? And and also like just personally, like to say like, I don't want to talk about that today. Yeah. I don't want to talk about that tonight. Let's talk about this instead. That's mm. like personally, I think is one of our successful okay. traits to, for either one of us to say, time out, no. <laughs> give, me, give me a break. Yeah, my wife uh, who, homeschools our children yeah will often find the only available time to talk about bookkeeping and you know mm -hmm. accounts receivable is 10 o'clock at night yeah. yeah at the time where i'm just like please Toast. shut the door yeah. right like yeah, yeah. uh and so I'm, I'm i'm learning to be able to say i don't want to talk about that right now yeah. right and uh and i think she's learning to be able to take that and say all right well when are we going to talk about it which is still uncomfortable yeah. but you have to do it you have to, I mean, we put a meeting on the calendar, mm -hmm. you know, for tomorrow for a conversation that we need to have. Fabulous. That you didn't want to have on the weekend. That I didn't want to have on the yeah, weekend. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. And then, you know, the other thing I, I feel like yeah. really has is important, and I'm sure it sounds like you are uh, aware of this, is it, it's not so much a boundary as it is being clear, it's clarity about accountability. Yeah. And that's really been yeah. a huge. Before that, we were there was much more sand in the gears. But... Oh my gosh! But yeah, because we were always in each other's stuff. Yeah. Because I can look at how the business runs day to day and mm -hmm. see ten different things that yeah I would do differently. Right. Yeah. Right. And certainly, uh, everyone mm -hmm. on the team has their opinions about how we should be educating and growing our people. But like when we when we agree, we have those agree, and then we make commitments around, well, who's going to be accountable for what, then uh, that helps a lot. Smooth it out. It smooths it out a little bit. There's still some friction. Well, there should be friction. The friction like, is good, though. Yeah, we're also- we're Are also, you still show our team about that? That would be really interesting. Yeah. It, hear what their perspective. We're both tolerant of each other's points of view in a way that we, we get each other in like- we can have we can take a decent amount of friction as a relation in our relationship because we've been together a long time and been through a whole lot. So, like often the things that are friction feel like small things to us. So that just maybe it's just us personally together it feels huh. that way often. Like Maria can frustrate me, and I'm like, okay, whatever, that's fine. I'm not even worried about that. I don't need to, I don't need to dwell on that. She said that like, oh wow, that's yeah. not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm certain. Uh, and we didn't get a chance to dig really into sort of the second career for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but there are folks for whom or with whom this episode is going to resonate deeply. And they may want to reach out. Yeah. Um, they may want to forge a partnership with a company that has d such deep ethical yeah. uh, considerations and uh, moral compass. Uh, they may simply just be inspired and have questions about how they can do more of what, what you've done. How do you like to be found? What's the best way for them to reach you? Email no, is come. best for me. Mm -hmm. yeah, what, and I what is that? Uh, B-K-I-N-G-E-R-Y at southern-energy.com. Okay. B-Kingery. B-Kingery. And then Maria? Yeah. And I am easier to find. Okay. I'm Maria at mariakingery.com. Okay. I'm not as speedy on my email responses. <laughs> that makes two of us. That makes two of us. But but I'm, it is. I'm grateful that Bob is. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 yeah. As, as people are grateful that Jeremy does. Yeah, yeah. totally. And I mean, I, I don't have, a, I, I'm relatively active on LinkedIn. Mm. So I'm, and are you actively taking on clients? I am to what, actively, very selectively taking on clients. What do you do for those clients? I help them implement operating systems mm. uh, such as... Is there a specific, Such as SEM. Is there a specific type of business or size of business that is particularly well suited for your services? So, I mean, my experience is in the clean energy space, mm -hmm. and I like working with companies who have gotten to a certain scale. Mm -hmm. so like I minimum would, revenue of? I would, oh, I would say minimum. I mean, I don't want to say a minimum, but Come on. I, okay, ideal would be probably ten million. Yep, ten to a hundred. Yeah, ten to a hundred okay. to mm -hmm. to start. Yeah. yeah. That sounds right. Mm -hmm. Growth oriented. Growth oriented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Impact being the the primary, yeah, with, the primary filter. Uh, yeah, it's like with, what with, are we doing in the world to make cool. bigger impact? Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm gonna ask a, a different final question, and I'd probably I'm gonna solicit answers from both of you. But we'll fast forward to 
Oh, who knows? You should have, uh, in some in somebody else's story, you guys should have already retired from Southern Energy Management. Let's fast forward to 2040. So we're in 2040 and you guys are you know finally ready to hang up your spurs. How from now, 2024 to then, has Southern Energy Management evolved in both its impact and its and the community within which you work? And then maybe if you if you have a thought about it, what what are some of the accolades that they they shower upon you in terms of the way that you've impacted the the local community? Right, you've won countless awards. But what are the ones that you're most proud of from 2040? Looking back, hmm. what a what a great question. I think from the impact perspective, we've just continued to grow our impact sustainably and in a way that honors our team and the and all of our values. Mm. From a perspective of what are the accolades, this is a, I have a little bit of a contrary point of view on this, I think, than most, because it's not important to me for what we're remembered by as much as many other people say, I want my legacy mm. to be this. I'm not so sure. I, I don't, it doesn't really matter that much to me what my legacy is, because I feel like that's, I'm one human being on a giant planet. Um, and I feel like um, that people would say like they, they chose to do business differently and they succeeded. Mm. That would be the main thing. Yeah. The sustainable, the B Corp values and the way we're doing what we're doing to me would be as important as the number of megawatts we installed, perhaps. Thank you. I know I'm going to go maybe the flip side and this, yeah, totally. this may yeah, be yeah, a yeah, great, yeah. I, I'm going to go sort of the, I really want people, since we started Southern Energy Management, and I don't know if this is ego, I'm not sure where this is coming from, but I've always aspired for us to be an organization that other companies want to emulate. Mm. Yeah. And so I would, between now and 2040, I would hope that there are other companies out not not just that Southern Energy Management has continued to thrive yeah. and look how they did it and they yeah. passed it along to their team. They found a way to do that and where everybody really created a lot of prosperity. Yeah. Um, but that the other companies have have followed our lead yeah. in that. Mm -hmm. And, that, and be able to point to just hundreds of them. Yeah, well, that would be good. <laughs> You can tell it's the question. vision, right? Yeah, yeah, shit happen. I like it. Yeah, great. Uh, I've never asked that question. I like I like um yeah, being able to think, think on it that way. Yeah. I think we'll be retired before twenty I don't think I don't think there's such a thing as retirement either. Yeah, I'm I feel never like, retiring. Yeah, I'm not gonna retire. I've got too much in me to, to retire. Sure. And what if we make it to twenty forty, boy, that'd be that to see that's longer than here at SCA. Yeah. <laughs> like, Thirty something. I, I think we will have failed the team if that Yeah, I, agree. I don't know. I, I would I would push back on that. I think that you would not think I don't think that the Sunlight and Power folks think that Gary has failed the team and he's there running the yeah. running the ship. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. yeah, that's yeah, a, yeah no Gary well. And uh, stayed at his house this last year. Yeah. 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 yeah interesting. And, yeah. And, and and you know, we don't without going into any detail about Sunlight and Power as a company and, and that I think that thirty plus years yeah. is itself an incredible um job. Yeah, right? yeah. To create a job for yourself yeah. for three decades. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, we could certainly have a whole lot more conversations. I hope that we do have more yeah. conversations. I'd like to get, I'd like to lean into love and hear more. <laughs> yeah. Get Maria. All that. the ways that, that love she can, can be yeah. woven into the fabric of the company. But we don't have time for that today, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so grateful to each of you who have stuck around to hear all of the wonderful insights given in today's conversation. Thank you to, Bob and Maria for taking time out of a busy day and a busy week running an important company uh, to be here sharing what I think are our legacy leaving evergreen type, type, types of, uh, of advice and value bombs. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. If you think that this is insightful and interesting and impactful in any way, please don't hesitate to reach out to Bob and Maria. Leave us a note on the published post on LinkedIn that will leave probably somewhere down here in the description. Or if you're listening on audio, please do click in the description on the show notes over to LinkedIn. I promise we've left a, a rabbit trail there. Of course, you can always go to mysuncast.com. If you, like me, are an infinite learner, well, 
my fellow, fellow Philo Math, we've got tons of research and links and all the books that were mentioned today in the show notes on the podcast page there. I want to finally thank our sponsors who help make sure that this is free to you. It just costs you the one thing that you won't get back, your time. And I appreciate that you've paid uh, the, the one thing that I asked you for, which was attention. You made it all the way through to the end of this episode. So if you would pay it forward by sharing it with someone else that might benefit from this, that uh, would be just uh, put me over the moon. It's how we reach more people that are intelligent thinkers and business builders like you who are trying to impact the world through building kinds of businesses like Southern Energy Management that really do tackle one of the biggest challenges uh, to future generations, and that is climate change, uh, but also building businesses that matter for people to have a home and, and a job that they love and a culture that embraces them and, and shows them how to lead, right? Thank you for leaning in with us once again on this episode. We're here every single week, twice a week, tactical, practical episodes on Tuesdays, Deep dives with entrepreneurs like the Kingrees on Thursdays. Remember, you are what you listen to. Thanks again for showing up, Solo Warrior. That's half the battle.